to the camera.
afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the master class, piano master class with Ursula Open. So uh, my name is Son Yong Hwang, and then I am the adjunct uh, the piano faculty at the UTPB, the Permian I mean, University of Texas Permian Basin. Uh, I thank all in here at the Mason Hall and those who are watching this event online through the Facebook. It is great honor for me to introduce and welcome the master teacher, the Ursula Opens, for this beautiful afternoon. Uh, the professor Ursula Opens is a legendary American, the pianist who is well known for her performance in new music, especially the American contemporary music. She has numerous recordings from the standard piano repertoires to the contemporary music. And among them, five recordings were the nominated for Grammy Awards. How outstanding, right? Then what I really impressed for the, her career is uh, the Professor Opens has commissioned and premiered many compositions, including works by Elliot Kartner, Anthony Braxton, John Adams, William Barco, such a uh, brilliant and then very famous American the contemporary composers. So I am very excited to be here and to have the opportunity having master class with this legendary American uh, pianist. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome Dr. Uh, Professor Ursula Opens with enthusiasm. Well, I'm thrilled to be here, and we are going to have the great privilege of hearing two of the most famous sonatas by Beethoven. The first movement of the Patiki, uh, which is Opus 13, and the last movement of the Tempest, which is Opus 31. Yes. And I'll just start by saying one of the reasons I started being very involved American music is that I was so sad that I couldn't meet Beethoven because he lived a long time ago. So it's really always exciting to hear the music. And we will start with Abigail Vincent playing the first movement of the Patatique Sonata. Thank you. 
That was a very musical and expressive performance. Um, I have not so much to say about it. I felt sometimes when things were piano soft, you were giving it too much sound and there wasn't, and it could have stayed soft a little bit longer. And it's a different kind of excitement, you know, when something is soft and fast and going to get loud or whether you let it get loud right away. You know, it's just, a, it's holding off the excitement. Um, I, as I said, it was very, very musical and I enjoyed it a great deal. And some things I would talk about, maybe we have different editions, you know? Um, in the first slow section, I had that here, sorry. Um, And you are separating it quite a bit. The same thing at the end of it. And I would suggest that even though it's just marked as a 64, from there to there, that you take time because it's such an important interval, you know? Um, and if, okay, in the fast music, you could stay piano, it's this theme. And now it's piano again. It, towards the end, you have it once in forte. And that's quite exciting and very different, you know, when you have it right before the last, Graph, the last slow section. But other times, it's almost always it's piano. So those would be the things, but I, I just loved how many things you did which were so expressive. Um, so would you, could you start it again? So that you you have room to make a crescendo. Okay. Do you have that written that it's piano the this chord? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, right what did you do from the top again? Sure. so much between you know I mean you can look the other way
have again. It sounds great, but again, this is a place where I thought if you started the crescendo a little bit later, it would be more effective. Okay. So, do you want to start just two measures before you stopped? Sure. Uh, about measure seven. Oh, actually, there's another question I had. Could you play the very beginning of the sonata again, just the first two measures? One, two, three, four, fifth measure. You sort of play that in a slower tempo than the opening. Okay. So, um, if you wrote. And I'm just playing it when you hear the sixth so that. You see, it really shouldn't be any slower. Yeah. me the whole time that I've been studying this. Um, I just can't seem to find where I want it to grow, I guess. Well, it, you're doing it in a very musical space. It's just the data that says increases the tension by not wanting you to do it right away. Yeah. You know, the same thing I was talking about. You want to do something, but you hold off for a minute, mm -hmm. you know? You want to go from the top one last time. Uh, so I have. Um, so right 
I mean, you have fourth and one of fourth sando. A fourth sando is within the dynamic of, so it's a little more than the piano, but it's not. Oh. Yeah. That makes sense. Though in Beethoven, generally, if you have a series of sotandi, one thinks of each one as being a little more than the last one. Okay. Okay. You want to go this from the electro? measure, I think, 25, there's a subito piano. It kind of tells you that the music has changed. So you're playing, um, so, sorry. You, you know, it's different music suddenly. Hmm. It's piano.
here tells you that you've come to the closing material of the exposition. Hmm. You know, this is like a little closing theme. So, um, you know, keep it the same tempo, okay. but it's a different character. the recapitulation, which was also very beautiful. And um, again, you have the, the, it's also a little bit of time is involved with da, 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 hmm. you know? So why don't you go from here? I mean, that's not too loud, but you know.
Okay. The, it was great the cadenza getting a little bit louder, but the C should have been piano. Okay. So, yes. That takes a lot of control. Try it one more time. <laughs> to be, yeah, okay. Let's see. Well, I have to start at the beginning. Okay. The thing about Beethoven's subito pianos are sometimes he wants to go against the grain, and that's somehow a very characteristic thing of Beethoven. And it's worth just sort of thinking about that, like saying, well, I don't want a subito piano here, but Beethoven does. And you have a little bit of a dialogue that way, you know? But it's really beautiful playing, and thank you so much. Remember to wash their hands. <laughs> um, and now we have Azalia Rivas, or how do you pronounce her name? That was pretty good, actually. Yes, Azalia Rivas. Ah, uh, great. And, and she'll be playing the last movement of the Tempest Sonata, which is up to 30, book one.
I think it's a little bit on the slow side. Have you thought about the poem? Are you planning to try to play it a little bit faster by the time of your recital? Yes. Yes. So um, it's okay that it's slow, but think about getting it a little bit faster. Okay. So it's a little bit more. to that tempo. You could do it. Cool. Can you try a little bit now even at that tempo? Yes. that out. 
up a little more. that's in 2-8, um, you know, uh, let's see. Sandy, if you can. Great, that was terrific. Um, do it one more time and keep going.
deal with the figure in two eights, but the Squatsandi are really important. You're pulling them, but now you can do them more gracefully. <laughs> They really don't have to be. But they're such fun because he's telling you two contradictory things at a time, you know? and then a really surprising fortissimo entrance, right? Yeah. Okay, so from somewhere, wherever it's comfortable to start. of a joke that after this very big sonata it just vanishes into thin air you know so um do it one more time from here Both 
played very beautifully, and I enjoyed it very much. I would say the one thing is pay a little more attention to Beethoven's dynamic and think about what they might mean. Beethoven writes sometimes more dynamics than you want. Still, um, it's important to sort of say, what could this mean? And then if you really say, I can't stand it, you don't do it. But you have to think about what it might have meant, you know? And then we will have the Q&A time from now on. So if you have any questions about the uh, professor, the uh, opens, and then please come out and then please ask. Well, um, basically, you're not quite sure that you're hearing accurate dynamics, and sometimes variations in tempo also might be the internet and not the fitness. Yeah. But I think, well, today we're doing very well, I feel. I mean, I really feel that everything's working beautifully. Also, things have improved, you know, since the long, since last March. I think it do really try to upgrade its sound, and it seems that Microsoft would also upgrade its sound. We're terribly dependent on technology. I mean, I've been thinking, when this is over, not only will I be able to see my friends again, but I won't have to try to learn more technology, because it's hard for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I think younger people are probably better at it. Uh, but the main thing is, well, I found actually where I teach, which is at Brooklyn College, Union, that everyone has been practicing a lot. <laughs> they sound very good. And in general, um, we found that students have done extreme, I mean, Sometimes there's the question of maybe being depressed. In terms of the schoolwork, people have in general done wonderfully. And um, the other thing is, of course, when you have your friends in person, seeing them online is great. And we've had more studio classes, more frequent studio classes than in the past, because it seems that people really wanted them, you know, that just getting together and playing together, even online, was so much better than not doing it at all. Yeah. So I guess those are the main things. Um, but today, everything worked really beautifully. So I'm quite thrilled. Um, you know, here dynamic. Sometimes also, when you're teaching, if you're not hearing dynamics very well, you can still see how students is approaching the piano. Yeah. And sometimes you think, well, they might, they might be back, but you weren't, um, because you just uh, play very hard, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the combination of seeing and hearing worked. Um, how did you do a quiet? Well, they must have been there first. Yeah. Because that doesn't work. So, um, but in the fall, we were actually in person with my uh -huh. and, and things. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Well, that's great. Yeah. I mean, I found chamber music, making music together, and the whole this thing are fine because of the delay you have, you know. Well, I always 
have done what you do. You should also go to a concert. You know, go to a place and play a concert, do a master class. So I um, haven't been doing the concerts much. There are a few, you know, so lecture demonstrations. Um, we're preparing for, I'll start rehearsing with a swing quartet in person next week. And we'll do some concerts, but then we stream, you know. So at least, at least there are streamed concerts now from concert venues, and we're hoping that eventually, you know, with a certain amount of social distancing, we'll be able to return to live concert. Um, I think so. Initially, you know, the other thing is if you combine social distancing and streaming. A concert can have just as large an audience as it would in, if any, everyone passed into the arena. That's true. So, so that, that's the kind of exciting future world that I think will have benefited from this. Well, thank you so much, Miss Hawkins. It's been such a pleasure to work with you. Well, thank you so much, Yes, Brandon. Hello, my name is Brandon. I'm a trombone player here. Uh, not as proficient on piano as some of the other people. Um, okay. But it's really an honor to, to have you teach us today, and anyone can read your biography, but in your amazing career, I was just wondering, kind of for fun, what is your, your fondest memory or, or moment that you remember, if you had to choose one? I know it's kind of a tough... Well, there couldn't be one. <laughs> I, mean, I have to say, in a general sense, working with composers has been a lot of fun. Um, I, there are many reasons I have done it, one of which the silliest might be, but my mother was a piano teacher, and the only person who had authority that was superior to that teacher is the composer. You know, like someone says, you should play Beethoven this way. If Beethoven were to show up, he said, no, I would like it another way. So that was one thing. But it's also been fun to see what goes into writing a piece. You know, and to, I love learning a piece that I can't hear. So I really have to figure it out from the music itself. Um, the most disconcerting moment I had, that I can tell you, <laughs> was I was playing with the Chicago Symphony, which I did a couple times, and the day of the concert, they said, well, we didn't know how to tell you, but there's a convention of music critics coming tonight. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> that was, that, that's place in one's memory. You know? <laughs> um, I love playing Czech music. That's maybe the most fun. And it's a form of improvisation in that you rehearse, but in the concert, you listen to someone and they do something slightly different, and then you do something slightly different to be, you know, to really be with them. And that's, that's sort of like a heightened form of friendship, you know, that just as you talk to your friend, want to be alert to their moods, and with playing every music, that, that's sort of the best for me. Um, and so what you do you play both classical and jazz, or just? Uh, mostly classical, but mostly. Uh, jazz every once in a while. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, because I was brought up very classical, but I, and I can't really play jazz, but I do love improvising as well. You know, and again, which has to do with listening to other people. So, um, I guess listening and making music together are the best thing. Yeah. Is there anybody who have any questions for the doctor, the professor? Open? No? Okay. 
then, um, thank you for the sharing of your uh, reflection on the online class, and uh, thank you for the sharing of your <laughs> the memory of the memorable. The, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I have questions that um, many students and then and then met, and many the performer like me <laughs> wants to have the uh, practice and the perform the new music even though that the new music uh, usually cont contemporary music repertoire is uh, very hard in technically and then musically. Do you have any specific the uh, practice strategy? And then if you have it, then can you share it with us? Well, actually, there are several collections of pieces that are good pieces to start with. One is published by European American Music, and one is published was the Carnegie Hall Millennium Piano Book. And one of the things is start with a piece that's not too long. You know, that's one of the basic things because you, know, you want to master the piece, and if it's 20 minutes long, that's going to be just so much more work than a piece that's about seven minutes long. And, um, let you know, you I'll go off camera for a second because I want to show you both these books, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I know where they are, so. So this is the book by European American. It's a collection. And here's the other one, another collection. And but I'll answer your question now in a different way. Um, there are two colleges in Odessa. Mm -hmm. Are there any young composers there? Uh, is is there any faculty member or any students in Odessa who are composers? Because that's the way to start. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, there's someone in the room who's a composer? Yes. Who? Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Um, then you should write for your friend. And then you can work together. And if a friend says that this is too difficult, <laughs> okay, so tell me your name. Uh, my name is Levi. Levi. And you are, I, I can't exactly tell, are you student or faculty? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you're studying composition. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And um, there are a lot of performers here, too. Mm -hmm. And actually, I started playing the music of my friend. I was in college, and I went to a college actually that did not have a performance program, but it had a composition program. So if I wanted to hang out with musicians, I hung out with composers. And if they saw this person hanging out with them and decided to write for me. And I mean, I also was playing Beethoven and Schumann and Bach and all that, but it was fun to play the music of my friend. And so that is really the way one starts playing music. Because, as I said, I couldn't hang out with Beethoven, who was long gone. And I'm not even sure he's a fun person to hang out with, <laughs> what I hear. 
Have you written for a fellow student? Uh, yes, I believe I have. Uh -huh. I haven't written much that's actually been performed because there's been other stuff going on, but I hope that changes sometime soon. Yes. Well, um, the other thing is to the director of the choir, someone who coaches chamber music, and say, you know, can I write for some of your students? Could I write a movement for a piano trio? Um, that would be fun, and you'd get it to form. And um, I know that sometimes students say, well, I should practice my Beethoven, I should practice my Bach, and I have a jury coming up. But please, you know, if the professor is for the student doing some really new music, it will happen. And it's very good because then you can also work with someone who can say, well, you know, this is really, really hard. Can you do something slightly different, you know? So, I mean, so that's what I would recommend. I mean, eventually you might want to write an orchestra work and that's hard to get performed. But for the moment, there's a choir, with um, chamber music. You heard how good the planets are, so um, you could write even as polo piano piece if, you know, if someone's willing. And I think it's, you sort of need the, prof the support of the professor. Um, you know, if the professor tells you, you no, know, you shouldn't waste your time, well, and you're stuck. But I think most people are off of mine. time with working, playing Beethoven music, um, I just wanted to kind of ask you, what was your favorite part about learning a Beethoven piece? I think what I, a little bit what I was talking about is trying to decipher what does Beethoven mean by his marketing, you know? Does he mean that it's new character? Does he mean that I mean, it's like reading, like solving a puzzle in a way, uh, or reading a detective story. What does this tell you about what the character might be? Like when I was talking about the end of the Tempest, uh, you've had a very big sonata, and then it just ends. You know, it doesn't end. You know, another way of ending would be, you know. that way at all. <laughs> <And> <laughs> um, it's fun to kind of, well, you can't ask the composer, what did you mean? To figure it out, if you can, from not only the notes, but the harmony. And some composers write many fewer dynamics than they do. And you, Look at the shape of the line, and um, you try to make the line come along, you know, because you basically, when you're performing, you're telling a story to someone else, and you want it to be a kind of interesting story. Even if the story, I mean, some pieces don't change very much. You're not able to, well, um, even, well, some pieces don't change so much, um, but they're not changing part of the story, too. So, um, and I love Beethoven. I mean, we, you know, Beethoven's extreme of emotional expression, and that's what we really love about him most, maybe. But it's also the detail, you know, not the extreme. But, um, why, why don't we put a Scuto pan up there? Does he want it to be a surprise? One of the things in the last one of the, of the Tempest that's kind of interesting is sometimes you have crescendos to do two pianos. But sometimes you have a crescendo and a diminuendo, 
and then the piano is kind of seamless. So those are different things that are exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jorge. I bet you have really perfect information for us. And then, even though uh, the, these students are not the piano major students, they will learn many things from you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. And I will put in one bit of propaganda. I hope the professors will encourage their students to play music on their friends. Yes, I'd love to visit now that I've visited both colleges in Odessa. So yes, yes. I feel I know you. I would love to see you. Yeah. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate for okay. you being here again. And then and maybe someday we can have another master class. <laughs> I yeah. hope very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. my sincere gratitude to the people who enabled this event to happen. So organization of the CASAT in Basin and the uh, sponsorship, um, sponsorship uh, the Rare Charitable Trust and the Permian Basin Youth Cherubin, Traveling, I'm sorry, and the Odessa Art and Zines Big and Toy Shop. And then the one more, uh, the people that uh, Dr. Eichner, who's the chair of this music department, who support us very well, and then very much. And then especially, I really thank you to the Dr. Jane Gomez, the uh, orchestra director at the UTPB, and their IT team. Without their <laughs> hard working and that effort, we won't have this the event happen. I really appreciate it again, and then please, um, Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lastly, I really, really appreciate to all of you because you are in here to support your peers, the Azalea and then Abigail, to play with enthusiasm environment. You guys are really awesome, active audience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And then we will finish the, our uh, the piano master class with uh, Professor Ursula Hawkins. Thank you. Okay, thank you.